Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us today for the virtual training seminar on accessing and using national data for preparedness. We're going to go ahead and get started today. So first I'd like to take a moment to introduce our instructors. With us today is Michael Donnelly. He is a geospatial data architect with the Department of Homeland Security's Geospatial Management Office. Welcome, Michael. Thank and you, also participating. Thank you. And also uh, today, I, my name is Rebecca Harnett. I'm an assistant director with the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, and I will be helping to facilitate and providing some content during today's session. So for those of you who may be new to our organization, we just want to provide a brief overview of who the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation is. Uh, our vision is that a nation of emergency responders and leaders are equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying geospatial technology and data uh, to the mission. And certainly one way that we do that, that is through virtual training seminars like the one you're participating in today. Some additional background on us is that we are a 501c3 not-for-profit organization uh, governed by an independent board of directors that are public safety practitioners uh, nationwide. And we were formed at, back in over 10 years ago uh, by an informal alliance of the different national associations and leaders that you see uh, down below. So the purpose of today's training is that participants will have the opportunity to explore what data are available, and these are national data assets, uh, to your agency through Highfeld Open and Highfeld Sec Secure. You may have been familiar with it through the HSIP program previously. We'll also start to discuss how these different data assets can be used to support your agency uh, and region's preparedness efforts specifically. So a brief overview of the training objectives. Uh, we'll cover and learn about what national data assets are available through Highfeld Open and Highfeld Secure. Learn how that data can be applied to support your planning and preparedness and other efforts. Learn about how the data is being used today uh, to support planning and preparedness. And we'll also talk about how you can actually gain access uh, to Highfeld Open and Highfeld Secure for your agency's preparedness efforts. Uh, provided up here on this slide is a couple of brief terminology points that you will hear throughout today's session. Uh, and this is intended to be a reference point. We're not going to read each one word for word, but there are a few acronyms that you will hear. One of those is HIFELD, which you've already heard, which stands for Homeland Infrastructure Foundation Level Data. A big word, but we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute, as well as NPS, which is the National Preparedness System. And you may hear a term called CIRA referenced, uh, which is the Threat Hazard Identification and Risk Assessment process that you may or may not be familiar with, and we'll chat a little bit about that as well. And one uh, note to mention is that the recording of today's session, as well as the slide materials that are presented here today, will be made available on our website. And at the very end of this slide deck, there's a link to where that will be provided. And we will also be emailing it to all participants uh, and registrants from today's session. I'd also like to make note that you can ask questions uh, and you can use the Q&A feature in WebEx, which you should be able to see there from your WebEx uh, landing page in order to enter in any questions that you might have. We will take all questions at the end of today's session uh, and, we'll, and we'll review those uh, with this whole group. So with that, what I'd like to do is move on to the content of today's virtual training and, ha and have Michael Donnelly with DHS uh, jo join us here and present an overview of the HIFEL data. Mike, over to you. Thanks, Rebecca. And uh, thank you to uh, NABSIG um, for uh, this great opportunity uh, to uh, share with you some exciting um, news regarding the evolution, really, of the high field uh, program. Um, and so um, before I begin, let me kind of table set the uh, discussion. Next slide, please. Thanks. So um, a, a 
a little bit about what high field is. Um, so when we talk about high field, we're talking about the data products um, uh, that we'll get into in a little bit. But there's actually a governance uh, body. Uh, it's also called high field, and it's an active participatory subcommittee within the Federal Geographic Data Committee. It uh, builds upon a legacy of success for providing authoritative and best available national foundation level data to support the homeland security, homeland defense, and emergency preparedness missions across the nation. Now, while it's a governance body um, that makes decisions on how data is procured, which data is procured, it's also a vibrant and active community of over 6,000 users. And it's constantly evolving with new or evolving, uh, with, with new data needs to help support a wide variety of missions. And to this end, we're doing our best to help cultivate an ecosystem that, one, works with you, the user, to identify and define requirements for data, inventory the market and the multi-agency landscape to understand what's available to support these emerging requirements. Three is to obtain the data that's national in scope or in some limited cases when necessary, acquire licensed data to complement our government-stewarded data holdings. Four is to enable online access to publicly available data sets or ensure appropriate secure access for FOUO and licensed data. And then lastly, we want to work with our data providers to maintain this broad collection of data and archive data appropriately to support training exercises or to inform standard operating procedures and academic research to help improve and secure the homeland. Highfield leverages both formal governance chains within FGDC and informal feedback from our community to optimize our approach in building the Highfield data product that you're going to see here. We want to make sure we can maintain the currency, the completeness, and consistency to support a whole of the nation approach in geospatial data cataloging and provisioning data, uh, foundational geospatial data infrastructure. Next slide, please. So Highfield's been around for more than a decade now. Uh, it, it predates me here at DHS, actually. And uh, the transformation of Highfield, or what you probably know as HSIP, the Homeland Security Infrastructure Program, has really been a challenging journey for all of us. We've had to change our thinking and adapt our culture both inside and outside DHS along with our mission partners uh, in Highfield, and that's the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, uh, Department of Justice, the Department of Interior, and the United States Geological Survey. We've really had to work with all our partners to think about how to best serve the community. We were faced with balancing uh, access and enabling first responders with secure services and open services while also protecting sensitive data from being exposed. And one of the things that you'll see uh, in this presentation is that we've really taken the approach of not just changing the way um, we break out the data, but also how we make the data accessible. We used to ship DVDs. Um, and those were done on an annual basis, and you had to fill out a form and triplicate and then ship that form off to the netherworld and on the Internet, and maybe in a month you get a DVD in the mail. And, uh, and we've moved past that, and, and now we're using emerging core technologies from our partners like uh, ESRI and uh, the, the DHS Geospatial Information Infrastructure, and using things like web services to ensure that you, the first responder, always have the latest and greatest data, and it's authoritative because it's coming from the source. Next slide, please. So, uh, real quick, this is Highfield Open, and uh, let's see, can we do a click here, Rebecca? So what you're seeing here is uh, the front page of Highfield Open. And um, Highfield Open, you can Google Highfield Open now, and you can get to the web page. And what it is, it's over 270 data sets 
available to the public as dynamic web services and up-to-date downloadable files. It has built-in visualization tools. Essentially, we took what was not once known as ATIP Freedom and made it into a publicly accessible, publicly available uh, website where you can go and either get downloadable data or access web services in case you have uh, common operating pictures or, or mobile apps. Highfield opens integrated with the geospatial platform through data.gov and other data providers. This means that data that you find here from Highfield Open is accessible from anywhere and everywhere. There's really no wrong door. So whether you're on, excuse me, the geospatial platform or data.gov or Highfield Open, if you search for data and discover data, you'll find it in either of those platforms, a no wrong door approach. Um, next slide, please. Yep, sorry, I think we missed the slide here. Uh, that's fine. So uh, I just real briefly, since the release of Highfield Open uh, in February, um, we've seen um, something around 9,000 unique users. And so that's the good news, is that we're seeing a lot of, of usage out of this data set. So we have things that you can use like um, uh, cell phone towers or refrigerated warehouses, all those data sets are now available on Highfield Open. And so one of the things that we were challenged with is the secure aspect of this. And so while we were able to unlock 270 public data sets, now what do we do with the other uh, portion of Highfield that was either restricted because of handling caveats or restricted because they have licensing um, uh, constraints. And so navigating between open and secure information is truly challenging for us. We, we had to look at which of our critical infrastructure data we can make open to increase our security and which data must remain secure to strengthen our homeland. So taking a look at something like a mass casualty event scenario in Los Angeles, how would a user go about finding data on open or secure to enable them to use geospatial uh, technology to support their mission. So we, we built this web map um, to showcase how you can leverage data that's available to the public via Highfield Open, and then you combine it with data that's limited to approved state, local, and federal users via our new Highfield Secure Portal. Next slide, please. So let me take a step back and talk a little bit about the GII before we go into Highfield Secure. So the GII, the Geospatial Information Infrastructure, is where Highfield Secure lives. Um, the GII is, uh, is a homeland security platform that houses not just information like Highfield Secure, but applications like the DHS Common Operating Picture, um, the Cyber Communication uh, Common Operating Picture. And then it has a collaborative piece to it where if you wanted to stand up a community or a group um, to share ideas, information, content uh, with one another in a secure place, um, we, it has this group functionality. For those of you that are familiar with ArcGIS portal technology, that's one of the core um, uh, technologies that we're using here to power the GII. And so a lot of things here are very ESRI-centric, so um, it's very easy to use um, and simple to navigate. Go to gi.dhs.gov, and if you don't have a HISN account, which I'll get into later, um, if you have a HISN account, you'll be able to go into the GI and navigate and search for data, create maps, join groups. Um, very easy to use, and it's in a secure environment, and that's where Highfield Secure lives. Next slide, please. So this is Highfield Secure, and as you can see um, from, from the screen, it looks a lot like Highfield Open. Highfield community members and users will notice the same categorization of data layers they're familiar with from the ATIP DVD. So you can see that we're using the same taxonomy uh, that you're used to. So we have an agriculture theme, a law enforcement theme, a mail and shipping theme. The biggest difference with SECURE is that in addition to having the open data registered within it, 
it also has the most up-to-date and enhanced FOU and licensed commodity data. Um, one click, Rebecca, I think we'll get you to the next slide. So if you wanted to access the Emergency Services Group, simply click on that, and then you can see that you have several data sets available here. Um, so if you click through this, you'll see that you have airport and hospital standalone helipad uh, base stations. You have uh, the FEMA regions, fire stations. And so in the Emergency Services Group, you can see that you have the option for either downloading a file geodatabase, a shape file, or accessing the APIs in case you have web apps. Specific iconography was developed to help differentiate the different handling and access controls for each data set. So you can see here that the blue icons are publicly available data sets. The red icons are secure FOU or licensed data. So in a mass casualty scenario, um, you can click through uh, and find the location of fire stations that are critical uh, in mapping um, events of this nature. So you can see here on fire stations, you can see the description. Um, if you click here at Rebecca, you can see the access and use constraints for the data. You can see some of the metadata uh, behind it. Um, and then if users are providing comments on the data, whether or not, you know, um, how they symbolize it or how it's used, there's a very collaborative and very interactive way for users to access this data and also share with each other thoughts and ideas on how to best either improve the data or use the data. Next click, please. And one more. So very easily, um, you could see that you could add this data to your map. Um, there's a menu there that you could click on and add to the map, and instantly you get these icons that show you where the fire stations are in Los Angeles. And so knowing where fire stations are located is valuable, but there are other data sets on high field secure that we can leverage. Data sets like, um, click once, Rebecca. Helipad base locations. So these are locations of data sets, uh, I'm sorry, of, of helipad based locations available and secure that you can now access. And then what Rebecca's showing you here are uh, major sports venues. Those are data sets coming from Highfield Open. Um, we can use those sports venues to stage response equipment or use them as medical triage sites. Or if you click once, Rebecca, you can see public refrigerated warehouses. So these are uh, places where you could store medical supplies or, uh, God forbid, a makeshift mortuary. So using data from both open and now secure provides the community real-time, on-demand access to data without ever having to fill out a form and wait for a DVD to get in the mail, either annually or a month from now. You're always getting access to the latest and greatest data we make available and open and secure. These capabilities represent what we believe is a first step approach in meeting the Highfield community's emerging and time sensitive requirements to access the best available data. But we're nowhere near done. Over the coming months, we'll continue to load more data into Highfield Open and Secure. We'll continue to enhance and improve the user experience and accessibility to Open and Secure. And if you don't have a HISN account, and you want to access the GII, and you want to access Highfield Secure, contact the Highfield support team, um, HIFLD at hq.dhs.gov, uh, and we can share that with Rebecca later as well. Um, we'll be happy to help you. Actually, it's right there on the last slide. We'll be happy to help you, uh, help you get a HISN account so you can access Secure and see what's there. Um, but if you want to access Open Now, you can just Google Highfield Open, and uh, you'll get to the, to the website. And that's it for, uh, for my session. Uh, I'll welcome any questions or, or pause for any comments. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Mike. And what we will be doing is taking all questions at the end. We've got a couple of other components to today's virtual training, but there's a couple things I'd just like to highlight for folks uh, based on uh, Mike's initial presentation here. And one of the pieces that I think Mike described well is the use of the Hivefell data, both open and secure, uh, for operational readiness. Uh, and I think this is particularly relevant for a mass casualty type event that may be catastrophic in nature and requiring the support of resources and capabilities via mutual aid across uh, different political boundaries, where those coming into the scenario may may not already have access to things like authoritative local data for fire stations, uh, the refriger refrigerated units, uh, the uh, major event arenas. And so certainly this is a really key gap that uh, the high felt open and high felt secure is a really important national data asset to be able to support. Uh, but certainly the application of Highfeld Open and Highfeld Secure goes, you know, beyond operational readiness and also deep into preparedness efforts and that we need to collectively work on as a community nationwide in, in building our national preparedness and resilience. And that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today and, uh, ha and we'll be sharing some different examples of. Just a quick reminder for folks who may have joined us a couple minutes late, the recording and slides from today's session will be made available on the NAPSIG Foundation website, so I just want to mention that. And folks, if you have any questions, please type those into the Q&A feature within WebEx, and we will be running through a number of those questions at the end of today's session. Great, so what I'm going to talk a little bit about is how does Highfeld open and Highfeld secure? How can these national data assets be applied to preparedness? And what I've outlined here is just a handful of ways that we can start using these valuable data assets today at the local, state, tribal, territorial, and even by faith-based organizations and NGOs active in disasters uh, to be able to support our preparedness. Uh, some of those areas are certainly the use of the data for regional analyses that inform the, the development of, of CIRAs, uh, the Threat Hazard Identification and Risk Assessment, or more generically, if a local agency you're conducting a risk assessment that crosses political boundaries that you might not have the data you need for uh, on a regional level, you can certainly look to see if that infrastructure data is available through HSIP. I'm sorry, through Highfield Open or Highfield Secure. And the same thing applies in terms of either conducting, uh, you know, geospatial, geostatistical analysis and also creating decision support tools that are used in regional, developing regional emergency operating plans and other types of preparedness-based uh, planning efforts. It can also be used to inform large-scale consequence analysis, and that's particularly relevant with infrastructure data offered up through Highfeld Open and Highfeld Secure for things like regional catastrophic planning. And the other kind of key areas that we're going to talk a little bit more about today are using the data to develop train national training scenarios and use as a common data for public safety GIS training on the in, in support of preparedness efforts. And then also, and I, I think probably almost most importantly, use in exercise planning and conduct, particularly for those regional exercises that cross political boundaries and are multi-jurisdictional in nature, and we'll talk more about that today as well. So for those of you who may not already be familiar, uh, provided here is a graphic that outlines the national per preparedness system. Uh, this is obviously something national. I know FEMA is the ex executive secretariat over the implementation of the national preparedness system. But the three areas that we're going to focus on as it relates to integrating and using Highfeld Open and Highfeld Secure data are in areas one, four, and five. So that's identifying and assessing risk, which is the red area on the graphic, 
as well as planning to deliver capabilities, which is down here in green, and then validating capabilities, uh, often, uh, often executed through uh, emergency management exercises. So those are the three areas we're going to focus on in today's session. So one of the things that I'd like to do is talk about how we can use the Highfield Open and Highfield Secure data in understanding potential hazards in our communities, but also in our neighboring communities that we might not otherwise have data to be able to view and, and analyze against. Uh, and this is really intended to be an initial uh, ability to understand potential hazards. So I'm going to share a demonstration with everyone today. And you should be able to see up on my screen, there's a national map here that you see there's green areas, a red and yellow. The green areas uh, are areas that have been exposed to a, have a low number of hazards, and the red areas are exposed to many different hazards. And this actual data already, it already has brought in a number of Highfeld open uh, data sources to inform this analysis. And so this is a way to think about potentially where you might locate your exercise uh, or where you might need to focus a planning scenario around uh, questions like that. And then what you can also do is taking it a, a, a step further and looking at what is, say, for instance, honing in on a specific hazard, we're going to focus on earthquake risk specifically. So up here you can see a map uh, that has overlay of earthquake risk across the United States based on some authoritative data that we brought in. And what I'm going to do is focus in on a specific area. I'm going to go to Charleston, South Carolina. There we go. So this is a tool that NAPSIG built to help support the process of locating exercises and the community's efforts to understand hazards and risks in an area at a high level, again, high level, not uh, uh, it, for the purpose of, of regional views and identifying that. But here we have uh, Charleston, South Carolina. So as you can see, it's still loading some data, but one of the important things here in terms of understanding the risk is also understanding what infrastructure is there. And this is a really good example for how we've applied the Highfeld data into a tool that helps to inform and understand risk for preparedness activities specifically, and in this case, in informing exercise locations. So say, for instance, your area of interest is this region from, or this you know, broader area from a earthquake exercise, this would give you a view of what infrastructure is in here that may be potentially impacted in an earthquake in this area. And as you can see, you can pull up and see which data is included in here, and then you can also see, you can click on the different layer list, and I access that right down here at this layer list button that we have added in here. You can actually see this had come at specifically from the Highfeld data. So it is one example that we wanted to share today regarding the use of the data in preparedness, and in this case, specifically for having a general understanding of, hazard, of hazards in your community and or area involving across jurisdictional boundaries. In the slideshow. Bear with me here one quick second. Great. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about it because what we just shared with you is a, a tool and a way to use the Highfeld open and Highfeld secure data to understand uh, risks and hazards across jurisdictional boundaries on a regional basis. Maybe it's across multiple counties in your given state. But then what do you do with that understanding? Well, there's a couple of key areas that it needs to be applied to. Obviously, one is in planning efforts. And one of the key areas to point out is that the use of Highfeld data uh, and 
both in open and secure can be and should be applied across a number of different uh, planning efforts. Right here you can see kind of the planning stack as I usually call it, but really the sweet spot where the high felt data can be used to support these planning efforts is jurisdictional plans, but I think even more importantly, regional, state, tribal, territorial plans, federal interagency operational plans. So these are some of the key areas, and I've included just a couple of examples of these where we have some different regional plans. That the, the type, the data that is presented and available through Highfeld for infrastructure data can be used in conducting the analyses in support of understanding potential risks and consequences of different types of hazards and events uh, to support the planning scenarios that are used in developing actual plans themselves. So here we have a, a region response to a climate uh, changing climate, which is a climate action plan, very relevant type of plan where the high felt data can be used to support and pr the analyses that get rolled into a plan like that, as well as a national capital region um, operating plan and catastrophic planning assumptions. It's another, you know, perfect example of a type of plan that would incorporate the type of infrastructure data contained in high felt. Great. The other area where the demonstration that we provided it, it serves as a key example of how the data can be used is also throughout uh, emergency management exercises, and this certainly applies to exercises that you may be conducting in your state, in your region, even at your at the local level amongst neighboring jurisdictions. Um, and so, really, the data can and should be applied, you know, for those multi-jurisdictional related exercises starting at the very initial design phase, um, starting at initially locating your exercise, identifying, you know, areas for your exercise where the type of infrastructure that you're concerned about could be potentially impacted, and that helps to drive the actual locating of the exercise from a scenario design perspective. Uh, perhaps it's not, you know, the physical location, you know, from a logistics viewpoint that you would conduct the exercise, but from a scenario design perspective. Uh, so certainly the data can be brought into the types of, you know, geospatial analyses that would, you would use to build out and support those scenario design uh, processes in the, in the exercise development phase. And certainly the data can also be brought into conduct. So whatever technologies and decision support tools that you would use in operations, you would also need to ensure that you're using those in the conduct of your exercise. And certainly bringing in the infrastructure data through Highfeld can be used to provide additional situational awareness and inform decision makers about potentially impacted uh, infrastructure of interest to them uh, during the actual conduct of the exercise so that they can make those operational decisions most effectively to potentially uh, to, to potentially uh, support uh, and, and address any infrastructure compromises as a result of the scenario in the, in the exercise itself. And I think another important point is that the data itself really provides that reliable and consistent source of information and data throughout the planning process for an exercise. And this is, again, particularly relevant when you're dealing with a regional exercise that may be crossing multiple states, potentially even multi potentially across um, other political boundaries that you may not own only have your local authoritative data to be able to support. So from a preparedness and planning standpoint, it can be a very useful source of data uh, on the exercise front. Right, so these are just a couple of examples that I wanted to share with you of some multi-jurisdictional exercises where the high felt data, you know, has been brought in from a NAPSIG perspective to be able to highlight you know, the, in the exercises themselves, the impact to some of those key infrastructure concerns from an emergency management perspective so you can see how you can also bring it in. Here on this side of the screen, I have an example of a web application that was actually used to support both the planning and the conduct of an exercise and brought in high felt infrastructure data into the actual impact area. And this is a hazardous materials example, which is why you see a multicolored um, circle I, indicating and radius around that based on the type of hazardous material. So they can immediately see 
you know, which of those uh, nursery schools would need to obviously be evacuated immediately, and obviously that's a vulnerable population, so that helps to inform a decision maker of some initial actions that they need to take. Uh, it also would inform them of which of their emergency services may not currently be uh, able to respond to the incident because they themselves are affected. So these are the types of things that from an exercise perspective that this data is particularly useful here on. Now on the other side, I have another example, and this is a, a larger area than what you see over here, and this is also a GeoPDF, so it's a different type of map product that's actually used in an exercise situation manual. And this is another case where the Highfeld data was brought in to be able to identify which infrastructure is going to be in the direct impact area, or in this case, a debris field, which is the triangle polygon that you see here on the actual map itself, so that they would at, know immediately which resources would not be available to respond to this size of an incident that crosses multi-jurisdictional boundaries uh, in an actual event of this nature and affecting uh, an area of this size. It could also tell which, which potential critical infrastructure, again, pulled in by the Highfeld data, may have been impacted themselves, meaning there could have been debris that has caused damage to some of those facilities, so they can start to identify mission assignments and doing damage assessment specifically on that critical infrastructure. So those are the key examples that we wanted to share with everyone today to be able to address uh, how the data is used, and I think from Mike's perspective on the operational readiness side, and he gave an excellent scenario around a mass casualty event in the Los Angeles area, but then also bridging into those other preparedness activities like we discussed in, in planning, in uh, exercises, in identifying threats and hazards, and doing risk assessment. Uh, so certainly a lot of different capabilities there that are really enabled and enriched by using the Highfeld Open and Highfeld Secure data, especially in its current format that it's being served up at, in, as Mike shared with us today. So we're going to move into questions and answers um, pretty quickly, but one of the key things I wanted to answer is a couple of key areas here. So the first question is, is there a list of data assets that are contained in Highfeld Open and Secure? This is a question that we hear from many of our NAPSIG Foundation members, and the answer to that question is, it does not exist today, but yes, a list of the data sets uh, will be released on the Highfeld website in the near future, so that is something that's coming. Another common question that we get is, is the data available using a DVD? And the answer to that is no, DVDs of new data, um, no DVDs of new data will be created. So users will have the opportunity to download the data and create local copies of the data themselves through the web services that Mike shared with us today. And the, another question is, how is the quality of Highfeld data being addressed? And I think he, uh, Mike started to talk a bit about that at opening up today, but there's an ongoing data enhancement process on select Highfeld layers for 2016. Mike, would you like to elaborate on any of these frequently asked questions for our users uh, before uh, we yeah. move into the Q&A? Yeah, I'll Great. start with the first one you have up there, and thank you for all the questions and comments. I've been seeing them on the chat screen. Um, this, so the first one about um, the list, so there is a list that, that is in a draft form right now. Um, once, once we feel good about it um, and are, are fairly certain that it's accurate, we'll post it on the Highfield website, um, just like uh, what Rebecca said. Uh, the second question about DVDs. Um, so we are not making uh, new DVDs um, for the 2016 and beyond uh, data products. Um, however, you still can go on the Highfield website, and if you need the 2015 DVDs, we still have limited uh, copies of that. Um, it's still good data, um, but it is going to be dated um, in terms of the stuff that we're doing in both the enhancement and new stuff that we're uh, procuring and acquiring. Everything new is going to be either an open or secure. Um, so if you really need a DVD, you can still order that, but it's going to be from 2015. Um, and then the, that last question on your slide. Um, so we're always looking um, for, uh, for data um, from the community, um, not just data, really requirements and feedback on existing data. 
Um, so when we're going through the process, the governance process of which data should we focus our efforts in ensuring it's of good enough quality, it's great, um, you know, we always look first to what the community is telling us. Um, and then, you know, we, we adjudicate that uh, through our governance process. And based on what resources we have available, that's what we'll select as kind of our top 20. Here's our top 20 data sets that we are going to really put to the grinder and make sure it comes out squeaky clean. Um, did, Rebecca, did you want me to go through all uh, the questions through the chat? I kind of wrote down some answers here. <laughs> Great. Um, well, what I'll actually do is uh, moderate a couple of the questions to get us started on the Q&A piece. Uh, sure. So uh, here, I'm going to, I think some of the questions have been an answered. So let me scroll up here and let's see. So I think we've had some questions about the GII web uh, address, and I just want to highlight for those who are here, that, that was a common question. You can see right here on the screen, it set, ha, provides this web link right here. As I mentioned, these slides will be provided and rolled up on our website, and we will be sending everyone out an email with that link as well as a Highfeld website link uh, right in the email itself. So please keep a lookout for that if folks are trying to look for it. Uh, yeah, one of the next questions, go ahead. The one thing uh, we can also do, so, um, since, you know, the, the open site, the secure site, and the GII, and then the Hyphio website, those are four different URLs. Uh, what we can do, we didn't do it in, in the PowerPoint, um, but we can give you a, a one sheet that just has all the URLs so folks can navigate to the right place. Excellent. Thank you very much. That would be very helpful for folks. So, Mike, I've got one question here that we'd like to uh, uh, share with the group, and the question is, uh, what is the process for enhancing and improving the data sets? And they're specifically asking where they can request modifications to the data or ask for inclusions of other data sets. Yeah, so um, the front door, if you will, for our feedback process is really contacting the Highfield um, exec sec email, that highfield at hq.dhs.gov. That's, that's what I like to point uh, to folks as our front door. Um, on the Highfield website, however, um, for those folks that have been around and know HSIP, um, there is a feedback mechanism on the website. Um, just like everything else on the website, uh, we're working to improve that. Um, so if you were to go into the Highfield website and enter in information on a data set, you know, hey, the attribute is wrong, or I don't like how this thing is symbolized, or this is just plain inaccurate. Um, you could use that feedback mechanism process, and we do adjudicate that um, with the governance process to, to show folks, to show our partners, hey, we're getting a lot of comments about this particular data set. Maybe this is something that we need to float up to our top 10 or top 20 and prioritize for this year to conduct quality control. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, we'll go back to a data provider, um, especially if it's something that's under contract, and we'll tell them, hey, you just need to fix this, right? Um, so we don't, we, you know, especially for the contracted data sets, if there's something wrong or there's an error, those are things that we can immediately take action on. And for you, the user, the first step, uh, like I said before, is, is contact us and let us know what what the issue is, what, what, what some of the things that you're seeing, and, uh, and we'll take action and we'll figure it out. And, um, you know, we're, we're pretty good at communicating and letting you know how things are progressing. You know, the website uh, is going to get there so that uh, at some point um, you'll be able to track progress of your comments. We're not there yet, but uh, eventually we will be. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mike, for taking that question, and I think that gives a really clear indication of how folks can uh, help to support that, uh, that data enhancement and improving process, so thank you. That's great. Uh, I've had, a, I think, a more procedural question. Um, a couple of folks have asked, uh, if they had a previous HISN account for HSIP Gold, is it still active or do they need to create a new account? Um, so his accounts are a little bit tricky in that um, I don't want to get 
too much into the weeds, but um, a couple years ago, um, Hizen did go through a migration to a new environment. And so if you had a Hizen account saved back in 2009, 2010, um, that was before they migrated to their new environment, and so you needed to get a new his account eventually, essentially. And so what we can do and what I can offer uh, to the group is if you, if you know what your his account username is, send that information to the Highfield mailbox. Um, we have a, a HISN GIS COI administrator here in the office that can look up your account details. And if he doesn't find you in the system, then, uh, you know, we could start working with you to get, help get you nominated and validated. Another avenue for you, um, there is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week uh, HISN help desk. I don't have that information in front of me, um, but if you just Google HISN, um, you'll get to the main DHS.gov web page that talks about HISN, and in there, there'll be um, the, the email address for HISN and then the phone number. And I'll include that in the one sheet that I'll be providing Rebecca as well. Excellent. Oh, Great. There you so, th yes, this is the website that, uh, that Mike was mentioning, and I literally just Googled HSIN, these four letters, and this was the first link that popped up. So you can see here, there's, it, it's pretty self-explanatory um, in terms of the information on here, in terms of that hidden access. Thank you, Mike. Great. The, um, another question that we have is, is the Highfeld data available in the Esri Living Atlas specifically? Do you have any insight so, on that, Mike? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't know. Um, what I can tell you um, is that um, Highfield Open um, is uh, a very popular site, um, and it's something that I've seen Esri demo off of. So they're using a lot of the data in, open, in, in Highfield Open to help promote some of their existing web services. And so it wouldn't surprise me if you, could, if you were able to see um, Highfield Open data in some of Esri's um, uh, uh, products, so like Living Atlas and whatnot. Um, but I don't know that for a fact. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have a question now, Mike, about actual use of the data in response efforts, meaning an incident response during an event. And the question is, can HISN approved users share this Highfeld secure data with their response partners who may not already have HISN credentials? Okay. Uh, so that sounds like a very specific scenario, and fortunately I have kind of a general answer, and, and that's that a lot of the contracted data, what I'm calling licensed data in Highfield Secure, does have provisions to allow broader access to that data set um, in times of emergency, during specifically during presidential declared uh, disaster events. And so we do have the capacity here to open up uh, access to Highfield Secure licensed data sets um, to a broader community. Um, we're still under cons licensing constraints, so I couldn't tell you without knowing more about that scenario if, hey, you want to give it to, um, you know, uh, University of Oregon, some, some professors there want to do some modeling, or you want to give it to some NGOs because they have some cool app that you could use to, to support your, uh, your response. Um, so uh, I would say that for, for the person asking that question, contact us, the Highfield uh, mailbox, uh, to talk about what, what it is that you're trying to do, and we'll be happy to um, help you find the right answer. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mike. And I, you know, we have a related question here that I'll just you know raise, and if we want to specify any um, you know other considerations for it. But the question is, can Highfield secure data be used? or shown in something like a command post or an emergency operations center, um, you know, environment. And I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the answer to that is, you know, it's, it's certainly used in an application, you know, and by a user that would be appropriately, you know, credentialed onto his end and for use by, you know, intended community, community members such as those emer state emergency managers, or you know, county level that would be uh, making decisions in something like a command post environment or an emergency operating center. Yeah, yeah, you got that right. Um, you know, the the one thing that here at the geospatial management office at DHS, 
one of the things that we always um, say is that we serve the Homeland Security Enterprise. That's who our customer base is. And that's not just DHS components like FEMA, Coast Guard, CBP. That's really kind of the whole of the nation. That's, that's the state, and that's the locals, the tribal governments, uh, territories. And so um, for that kind of scenario, um, not just high field secure would be available um, for, for that, but you could use a lot of the stuff that's on the GII. Um, so if you needed to access, uh, you know, those geocoding tools, if you needed to access those map making capabilities, those are, those are for you, uh, the community, to, to use and leverage for your mission. Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike, for that addition. That, that's a really important one. And the only other thing I would add, you know, at a command post level, if you are the local agency, also be cognizant that some of your local infrastructure data may even be more accurate. So, you know, be always be cautious about when the right time and place is to use national data assets, such as the high fall data. Um, and to ensure that you're also using your local data uh, when and where it, it's needed as well. So I did want to mention that to folks too. Um, a couple of other questions here. Um, let me see. Uh, I, I've had a question about why is FEMA's software called Hazus not mentioned in, in, in today's session. Uh, what I'll share with you is, you know, Hazus is a, is a modeling tool and certainly what we're focused on today is the national actual data assets themselves in terms of infrastructure data and its use and preparedness. And I would add that Hazus absolutely brings a tremendous amount of value for, as a modeling capability and tool set um, for preparedness and for mitigation efforts uh, in particular. Uh, but today's session is specifically focused on national infrastructure data uh, and specifically high field open and high field secure. Excellent. Um, great. Um, I also have some question, a question from an individual, Mike, about under what conditions can uh, HSIN, HISN approved users access Highfeld Secure. Are there any, and I, what they're referring to is how previously with HSIP Gold it required, um, you, know, a, you know, an actual emergency declaration in order for that data to be made available. Are there any types of conditions like that in terms of the uh, Highfeld Secure accessibility? Yeah. That's a great question. I didn't really get into this um, in, in the presentation. But essentially what you have um, now is kind of a, a three-tiered approach to making the data available. So you have the open data um, that's available to anybody. You have high field secure. And then within high field secure, you have the secure, which is uh, data sets, which is just FOUO data. And then you have licensed data. And so the question about how does a group qualify to high field secure, so anybody that goes into high field secure, if you're approved for access to high field secure, actually I take that back, if you have a HISN account and you go to high field secure on the GII, you see all the FOUO data. So there's no permissions needed for that. Your, your HISN account is, your, is really your first gate, if you will. Um, so if you have a HISN account, you can go to Highfield Secure today and see what's available and start using it. To get access to the license data sets, um, so those are your um, business points data, your uh, transportation data, like your, your street center lines, your, your address, in, address engine. Um, to get access to those data sets, you will need to go through a similar data use agreement process on the Highfield website. So similar to how you previously requested a DVD, you would go into the website um, and e-sign uh, a form, and then very quickly we have folks here uh, uh, approving and validating your request that can add you to access the license data sets. Um, I don't have any slides to kind of walk you through that work through, but be happy to, to do a follow-up with anybody that's interested. So essentially, just to kind of bottom line it, if you have a HISN account, you go, you can go to Highfield Secure and see all the FOUO data there plus Highfield Open data sets that's registered. If you need access to those licensed data sets, 
go to the Highfield website, uh, e-sign the data use agreement, and then um, we, we try to turn that around in less than 24 hours. You can get access to the licensed data sets that's also on Highfield Secure. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yes, definitely. Thank you very much. Uh, so with that, I think we're gonna just take a couple minutes and, and wrap, wrap up here. And, and Mike pointed out some really key websites which I'm gonna touch on at the end to make sure everyone knows exactly where those are as well as the email address that he referenced. Uh, so what we wanna do to, to close out here is uh, just a couple of you know, notes about NAPSIC Foundation and some of the offerings that we have with training and education, business planning, documentation, um, and whatnot. So this is what we have uh, up here. We've talked a little bit about what some of those things are that we do, as well as training and education. I do want to mention to folks that there's some additional opportunities to gain some hands-on training with Highfeld data, and particularly the Highfeld Open data that will be made available at the National Geospatial Preparedness Summit this September 13th and 14th in Washington, D.C. And the link here to register for that is open. Uh, so be sure to check that out if you're interested in gaining some more experience and also working uh, and taking, getting more hands-on and in-depth on the GII. And with that, I have up here, um, you know, here's the, the Highfeld support team uh, email address that Mike mentioned, as well as the Highfeld website for more information. And I provided a link here down below to where the recording and slides will be available. Again, we will be emailing this, uh, the links out to everyone over the next couple of days. Uh, so please, you know, stay tuned for that and, and be sure to check it out as soon as you get all of that information. And Mike, is is there anything else that you would like to share with the participants before we close out today? Uh, no, I just want to thank you again, Rebecca. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity. I hope uh, the presentation was uh, was useful to you, uh, you folks. And um, you know, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to engage us. That's what we're here uh, for: is to support you. Um, you know, we we love to hear your feedback on the data. We we're desperately trying to improve the data product so that it meets your mission. Um, so please contact us, highfield at hq.dhs.gov. Thank you. Excellent, and, and thank you, Mike, and, and DHS. I know a tremendous amount of work has been done to uh, improve and enhance the accessibility of the Highfeld data with Highfeld Open and Highfeld Secure. So on behalf of NAPSIG, we are very excited about uh, the potential here and hope that the examples uh, that were shared in terms of operational readiness as well as the different preparedness activities, planning, uh, risk assessment, and exercises are ideal ways to begin using and exploring that high-fall data uh, for use in, in building a, a safer communities and, and a more prepared nation. So thank you, Mike. And I also want to thank all the participants today for your time, and we hope very much that you found today's session beneficial to the work in your agencies. There will be a very short survey here at the end with three questions, so please provide us with some feedback specific to the conduct of today's virtual training seminar. Uh, and with that, it concludes our uh, virtual training today. Thank you, Mike, and thank you to all the participants for joining us. Have a great day.